Hey everyone, and welcome back to this Lead Green Associate tutorial to prepare you for your lead exam. Today's topic is going to be Indoor Environmental Quality, abbreviated as EQ, and we're going to be talking about occupant health and comfort with topics such as air quality, ventilation, thermal comfort, access to daylight and views, as well as acoustics. Now, according to the EPA, Americans spend 90% of our time indoors breathing indoor air. So needless to say, indoor air quality is very important, and a lot of these problems can be solved through proper ventilation. That's going to come up first. Now, a main theme here is that comfort and health increases productivity and therefore the economic bottom line of a company or building. So as usual, let's begin with the checklist. We see our prerequisites up here, but one thing I want to point out before we cover all these is this one, low emitting materials. This sounds like it should be in the materials category, but it's not because that is more focused on sustainable purchasing. Of course, we're concerned with emissions on materials as well, but the giveaway here is low emitting. That's what tells you it should be in indoor environmental quality because we're talking about VOCs, off gassing, and how it contributes to air quality. So let's head into the ventilation strategies first. This is the first step usually. It's about air exchange, introducing fresh air into the building. And this is measured in cubic feet per minute. Usually building codes require 15 to 20 cubic feet per minute per occupant. Our baselines up here. These terms can be pretty confusing, but they're so important to know for the LEED exam because this is where LEED gets its baseline from. ASHRAE 62.1 and 55. ASHRAE 62.1 is concerned with HVAC systems, ventilation, and indoor air quality standards, whereas ASHRAE 55 is concerned with thermal comfort of occupant. SIPC AM10 is concerned with natural ventilation rates for non-domestic buildings. So these are the three main standards that we're going to be concerned about in this chapter. So the main theme is CO2, smoke, dust, chemicals, volatile organic compounds, and off-gassing are all hazards to building occupants that can be decreased through proper ventilation. Higher ventilation through a proper HVAC system means cleaner air. Then we have this term down here called the Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value, or MERV. These are basically standards for, for vents, for filters, uh, it's a rating between 1 and 16. 16 is the highest rating, and we want our rating to be at at least 13. The goal here is to prevent sick building syndrome. Sick building syndrome are these temporary symptoms that people may experience within a building, coughing, dizziness, headaches, nausea, and these symptoms usually go away when the person is outside of the building. So they can happen with poor ventilation and poor indoor air quality. Now we head into uh, air quality itself. We want to set the minimum air quality performance according to the prerequisite. Mechanical and natural ventilation standards must be in place under ASHRAE 62.1 and meet those requirements. Now enhanced IAQ strategies, these can use mechanical, natural, or usually mixed mode ventilation. Mechanical ventilation is the use of an HVAC system or any mechanical system, whereas natural ventilation is using passive designs, using operable windows, the orientation of windows to collect cross breezes and the placement of windows and their design can play a huge role in natural ventilation. Now, a lot of lead buildings actually do use mixed mode. They use both. Control tobacco smoke, very important. Place smoking areas at least 25 feet away from a building and air intake or operable windows so smoke doesn't get in the building. Enhanced IAQ performance is where we set a permanent entryway 10 feet into a building or 10 feet out of a building, either way to collect dirt and debris before it enters. Basically a permanent floor mat. With exhaust, we want to minimize exposure from garages, laundry rooms, copy rooms, anything of that nature. For filtration, vents that supply outdoor air must have particle filters that meet a MERV standard of 13 or higher. For ventilation, we want to increase that 30% above the minimum. Monitor CO2. And finally, have naturally ventilated spaces under SIBC M10 guidelines. Low emitting materials, reminder that that's in this category and not materials. Reduce chemicals that can produce hazards. And we want them to emit low concentrations of VOCs, which vaporize at room temperature and can provide a hazard. Off-gassing from adhesives, sealants, paint, carpeting. There are a lot of risks here that can produce off-gassing, so we want to minimize them as much as possible. And points are awarded for not exceeding those thresholds. Want to minimize the construction impacts. So basically, when there's construction or renovation, we want to reduce the impact from that, implement a management plan for construction and for pre-occupancy, address all the control measures 
under SMACNA guidelines. This is the Sheet Metal and Air Conditioning Contractors National Association. Seal the construction area off from occupied spaces. Seal the air ducts so that when the building is occupied, then the, all these materials and debris don't go into the HVAC system and it gets spread throughout the building. Protect absorptive materials such as wood from the elements outside. Protect it from moisture so that it doesn't get molded. Then perform an IAQ assessment. Basically establish higher quality standards after construction and pre-occupancy. Conduct a flush out during occupancy and test the air quality, basically flushing all the air out of the building and make sure it's all replaced with fresh air and then test the quality of that. Replace the filtration and flush out all the indoor air. Establish a green cleaning policy for maintenance and custodial work. Make sure that we're using green cleaning products as we've discussed in the materials category. And integrated pest management. Basically, if you reduce pests, you reduce pesticides. You don't need to use that many pesticides if there aren't that many pests to begin with. So it all starts with reducing the impact from the start. Now let's head to occupant comfort. As we've said before, a main theme here is that occupant comfort and health and satisfaction produces a greater economic bottom line because people are taken care of, they're more productive, and they're all happy. Lighting, we want to have the proper amount of lighting to protect everyone's circadian rhythms. Basically, our natural sleep cycles, our natural behavioral cycles. Use tall windows, skylights, and reflective surfaces to spread out that natural daylight. Increases productivity, decreases stress, and decreases electrical energy. Then improve interior lighting by providing occupant controls to 90% of occupants so people can control their own lighting and have an automated system basically that detects occupancy so lights can turn off when people aren't in the room. For the acoustic performance, we want to use absorptive ceiling tiles, quieter HVAC systems, as well as specialized wall framing techniques, and this should all be done early in the design stage so that you don't have to go ahead and replace them all later. It's much more costly later. Overall, for occupant health and satisfaction, we want to provide system controllability, views to the outside world, and thermal controls, having building automation as well. Use occupancy sensors, operable windows, so that when it's nice out and it's breezy, people could just open up a window and the HVAC system turns off. Provide thermal comfort under ASHRAE 55 standards. 71 degrees is considered to be the most efficient temperature at what people can work at and be most productive. So that's important to know as well and provide thermal comfort controls to 50% of building occupants. Improve views to give people a connection with the outdoors. This comes along with daylighting as well, and this should be a clear image of the outdoors, no tints or anything like that. With space categorization, we should know that not every space in a building is going to be lit the same, it's not going to be ventilated the same, so therefore we have to take that into account. We have occupied versus non-occupied spaces, we have regularly occupied, which are spaces uh, that are occupied about an hour or more per day. It could be like eight hours a month, and uh, that still counts as an occupied space. And then non-regularly occupied spaces, which could be hallways, uh, locker rooms, things of that nature. Individually occupied versus shared. An individually occupied space is usually occupied by one person. It could be a private office, it could be a jail cell, a hotel room. Shared multi-occupied spaces are, of course, inhabited by uh, multiple people at a time, such as auditoriums, conference rooms, hotel lobbies, things of that nature, anywhere where there's a lot of people in the room. Now, in conclusion, you're really going to have to know these ASHRAE standards. They seem like you can get away with it, but really, it's, it's really important. It establishes the baseline for indoor environmental quality, for LEED, uh, you have to know ANSI, the American National Services Institute for Furniture Sustainability, SIBC AM10, remember that is the Chartered Institution of Building Services Engineers, it's the Applications Manual 10, and this is to define natural ventilation in non-domestic buildings, and then all the terms that you we may have covered in this video or you may have in your lead guides, such as flushing, such as the baseline limits, bake-out, things of that nature. So keep going through your checklists, keep refreshing your terms and taking the sample exams, and good luck, we'll see you later.